nation's grain growers, planting what's expected to be another bumper crop. The wettest two years on record have certainly set up ideal sowing conditions in eastern Australia. But with world supply looking fairly comfortable, most forecasters expect prices to stay flat. Chris Clark reports on ways some growers hope to take advantage of any little price spike available. It's a tricky business growing grain in the Mallee. Robin Schaefer's coming towards the end of his seeding program. There's a bit of rain on the way. With most of his crop in, he's hoping for some good falls in the next day to really kick things along. What's already in the ground needs a drink. Some of the stuff now, it's um, starting to get on marginal moisture conditions. Certainly, you know, everyone's looking for a bit more rain again soon. Risk is the grain grower's constant companion. At the moment, there's just enough moisture around to make last summer's stubble and weeds stick to the tines of the cedar. It's a pest when what you really want is a clear run to the finishing line. But out here, good rains are the exception, not the rule. We're basically now cropping a bit over 9,000 hectares to cereals, oil seeds and a few grain legumes as well. We will have, when we finish in a few days' time, about 7,000 hectares of wheat in the ground. We've got just under 1,000 hectares of of barley and just under a thousand hectares of uh, canola and then the rest is uh, basically uh, uh, grain legumes. Robin Schaefer and John Gladigo run a collaborative cropping venture near Loxton in South Australia's Mallee. Have a look at these roots down here. Good root system. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Secondary roots are going alright. Yeah they are, they're getting going. Some moisture down there. Oh, there's still stacks of moisture in that seed bed, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, once you get down... Water's the key, as it is for any grower, anywhere. Rainfall in the Mallee this season followed the pattern over much of southeast Australia. We had good rains through harvest time, which really gave us some good deep subsoil moisture, and then we had some more good rains in early March. So coming into seeding, our subsoil was virtually full, and the top was drying out, but we had enough moisture there to get the crop down into the moisture with no-till and uh, to get it up and established, and that's what we're looking at here. You'd think in a marginal area like the Mallee, they'd be reluctant to sell much grain before they've grown it. But forward sales, contracts to supply before the crop's harvested, are an important part of their marketing effort. Probably the biggest risk is to not be selling anything at all and having a whole crop that's exposed to the marketplace. Even a really poor year for us would be you know, 0.4 to 0.6 of the hectare, I guess, so that we can quite confidently, we believe, go in and sell 0.4 to 0.6 per tonne per hectare of our crop even prior to seeding because that's almost the worst case scenario in a decile one year. So while they're flat out seeding the ground, they're always looking at the market for selling opportunities. They must make the final decisions on what to plant and when to sell, but like many growers, they buy in professional advice. At the moment now, we've, uh, as you know, the moisture's drying back. Yeah, we're still able to get it down on the on the moist soil so you, at this stage. So you've got moist. Oh yeah, yeah. So germinating straight away. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all it's all coming through. Yeah, and it, and it throws Some of that advice comes from Chris Hinges, a former grain trader who's often on the farm to see how things are going and discuss when and how to sell. So what's your gut feel, Chris? You're a bit bullish at the moment. This market will change quite rapidly, um, and that's probably the, the the main thing is that. This is a weather market. We're going to see forecasters trading the northern hemisphere crop, and it's going to basically, uh, you know, it's going to be either disaster or it's going to be good. And that emotion will change quite rapidly. So we just need to watch it pretty closely. What they choose to grow is dictated much more by what grows best rather than where the price might be at sowing time. Our planning starts virtually 12 months before, really. Once this year's crop's out of the ground, we're looking at what the weed burden is, what the disease burden that is in, in the paddocks, and, and really starting to put in place what we're going to do with those paddocks next year. And, and even in some cases, it's two years. They'll tweak the final mix between different crops as they get closer to putting the seed in the ground. And that might be determined by the market outlook. The Mallee is regarded as marginal cropping country there's more chance of crop failure. It's the combination of yield and price which ultimately determines profits. With really good prices like we've seen in some of the last few years, we can get yields down as low as um, 
uh, 0.8 of a tonne to the hectare, and, and that'll be a break, break even price. But when the price comes back a long way, you know, we might need 1.2 tonne to the hectare to break even. Long term averages, we budget on about 1.2 tonne to the hectare here, but we'd expect to get that in probably 70% of the years. We'd expect to get better than that. While the Mallee's riskier, it doesn't stop Robin and John from forward selling as much as a quarter of their wheat crop in some years. At the moment we're probably actually less than 10% forward sold on wheat and that's partly because of the, where the prices have been at the time and, and we'd like to be a bit, probably a bit more than that. Some of the contracts that we do look to lock in aren't necessarily even production contracts but are hectare based contracts which in an area like the Murray Mallee where um, you know, one of the biggest risks is actually production uh, where we can actually lock in a price and have all that production off that given area locked away which is a great little extra avenue for us. For decades, grain growers' marketing risk was offset by the single desk, the wheat export monopoly that saw grain pooled and returns averaged out. But those days are gone, replaced by a new world in which the grower must decide how best to market their grain. Grain marketing is not a case of one size fits all. The weather, the seasons, the soil all play their part. Hi Brad, how are you? Hello, yeah, uh, Well, thank you. A bit overcast and dismal here. We've had a, close to a shower or so today. Victoria's Wimmera is a bit more reliable than the Murray Mallee in South Australia. This is where Simon Tickner grows the fairly typical regional mix of wheat, barley, canola and lentils. And Brad Knight is a broker who helps him sell what he grows. 225 delivered type price, we're seeing uh, that's a good 10 to even 15 to 20 dollar increase on what would have been available there only two to three weeks ago. Yeah, well, it's still uh, just a tad of what we're what we're targeting. I mean, obviously, you're aware of what we're after, so uh, if it hits that price, go ahead. I'll let you know. I'll give you a call back uh, later on this afternoon. Okay, thanks very much, Brad. See you. Bye. Bye. Sometimes it's the little things that make a deal worth doing. In this case, they're looking to ship barley out of Portland in Victoria. So there's two factors there. Freight advantage, where Simon's farms are, down to port, and a general lift in, in prices, so it's a good opportunity. $20 a tonne is nearly 10% increase. Um, so when you bring that to, back to a per hectare basis, that's, it's a substantial increase in profitability for just for holding on to grain for a couple more weeks. According to Brad Knight, the best approach is to try to target a higher average rather than trying to pick the market peak. Every day you enter the market you, you would like to pick the best price in the top that day or in that short period, maybe that week. But over the long run trying to pick the top price, you only know it was the top price after the fact. Uh, so we do advocate uh, an average selling program over, over a, a longer period and, and recognising things such as when, when the price of grain is significantly underneath your average cost of production over the long term, if you are in a position not to sell that grain, then try not to. It's about being flexible and agile enough to take the marketing opportunities that come your way. Simon Tickner's out spraying for weeds ahead of putting in lentils. That'll complete his selling program. Long-term prices dictate the broad mix, but like many others this year, He's putting in a bit more canola than usual. We've increased the amount of canola in our rotations, and that's partly agronomic, but also canola's been pretty good over the last 12 months in terms of its pricing point, and looks like it will remain there, certainly for this season. Similarly, the variety of barley that we sow, we've gone back to a feed variety, so something that's producing higher yield, but we'd normally expect to get a lower price than a malting variety, but in the overall mix, we think that's going to be more profitable for our enterprise. Simon Tickner has enough on-farm storage to be able to hold his grain from a normal year's production and trickle it out as prices hit the levels he wants. This is wheat from last year's harvest. This is APW wheat that's going to a container packer near Melbourne for export to Southeast Asia. This is wheat we sold during the first couple of weeks of our cropping program, so it's really only been sold for about three weeks and it's captured a couple of shorts that were in the market, so it's 15% above what we would have got for it a month ago. Generally, at this time of the year, lots of farmers are focusing on putting the crop in the ground and supply tightens up a little bit. I mean, we're not talking sheep stations. We may only be talking 5 or $10 a tonne, but uh, over that truckload, $10 a tonne is 
uh, an extra five hundred dollars that's onto my bottom line. Brad Knight thinks a lot of growers are still not active enough selling through the whole production cycle. One major thing we've seen is growers trending towards growing their crop and then selling it, which doesn't make sense from a marketing perspective. They should be, when they're spending their money growing their crop, they should be trying to sell it as they go. But the inherent production risk around growing or not growing crops depending on rainfall means that they're largely wanting to produce it, store it, and then sell it generally over time. To store or not to store? It's a question we looked at on Landline earlier this year with David Cook, who farms near Shepparton in northern Victoria. It's Lincoln wheat, so it's a variety that's going H2. It's a milling hard wheat. And I think currently at the, at the local uh, grain corp silo, it'll be making about $188 a tonne. The H2 wheat should be worth somewhere around about $250 a tonne port. Or we'll put it back here at about at least $225 a tonne next farm. How long are you prepared to store it for? Uh, we'll essentially store it through till, through till next harvest if we have to, 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 till we get the price that we're looking for. So, David, have you sold the wheat that we saw you putting into storage at harvest? Uh, yeah, look, Chris, we've sold some of it. Um, the premium for uh, hard wheat at, the, at harvest time on the world market looked quite good. And so we expected to get a good premium on that hard wheat, but it has actually hasn't eventuated on the domestic market. And if anything, it's actually uh, decreased since the price increase a couple of weeks ago. So we've sold some of it, but we're still sitting on some uh, at this stage. So it's been a fairly hard market to pick, really, hasn't it? Uh, well, it has, yeah. Since we saw him at harvest time, David Cook's had a lot of rain. He put this millet in more as a cover crop, but thinks he'll probably end up selling the grain. It could be a bit of a bonus, though it means the last of his wheat will go in very late, so he might take a hit there on yield. Another calculation to make. With ten and a half inches of rain at the start of March, it's a crop we didn't expect to get through to harvest, but uh, as you can see, it's uh, got through to harvest. So, who buys millet? Uh, there's probably two main markets for the crop. Essentially, it either goes back into the seed market, where all our millet went last year, or it can go uh, exported into the uh, bird seed market. David Cook has more reliable rainfall than some, so there's less chance of crop failure for him. But he doesn't forward sell grain he hasn't harvested. He prefers hedging contracts, which in essence pit the risk of one market against another. We generally don't sell any grain forward until we've got it in the silo, mainly for the reason that the, the trade in offer offers a decent price against what the international pricing is at the time. Um, as you get closer to harvest, uh, we'll often convert uh, hedged products where we use wheat and canola hedged on Chicago or, or Winnipeg futures exchanges and we'll use them to smooth out the um, price fluctuations throughout the year and try and set ourselves some target prices. Simon Tickner will forward sell a bit. Our marketing program starts around about now, about when the crop goes in the, in the ground, generally around May, and we will pre-sell before we've actually harvested the crop if we think there are some really good opportunities there and we're constantly looking at risk but we don't sell a lot before the harvest is in the silo and then the bulk of our sales then happen after the November December harvest. The reluctance of farmers to commit to selling grain they haven't yet grown is perfectly understandable and the reason simple rain the biggest single factor in crop yields across Australia's southern grain belt is rainfall. Rain to set up the sowing and rain to take the crop through to harvest. Chris Heinges doesn't only advise others how to sell, he's also part of a family farming enterprise in the lower mid-north of South Australia. Michael Farley's their farm manager. It's been dry and they're sowing later than they'd like. I think we'll get this job done and then we'll probably sit on our hands and wait for some rain. It hasn't been ideal but at least we've been able to keep going and get a bit done. Yeah. Looks like the rains, hopefully, we'll be getting some later today, if not tomorrow, so it'll be ideal really. Yeah, it looks like it's going Deciding to sow into dry ground is a calculated risk. Technology can help a bit. The latest seeders allow for more precise placement. Farmers can put fertiliser and seed where they want it. That increases the chances of successful germination. We've had some pretty dry conditions for seeding this year and uh, potentially with some older equipment that we, we've had previously, there wouldn't have been the opportunity to be sowing. We've got infinite adjustment on the pressure that we put on this press wheel, the pressure that we apply to this time, so in drier conditions we can actually penetrate the soil and also the, 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 the sowing depth that we ultimately want to operate at. 
Every day that seeding is delayed, though, can cut final yields. Our 